Hey, what's up you lot, Path here, and in today's video we are talking about this equation here, often used in many different forms throughout physics. Now, as always, although it looks quite complicated, you won't need to know any advanced mathematics in order to follow along with this video. If you enjoy this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe and hit the bell button and so on, and also do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Let's get into it. Now, the equation that we're studying today is known as the continuity equation, and for good reason. It basically deals with the flow of some abstract quantity over time and through space. The way that I like to think about it is that it makes sure that there are no continuity errors for whatever phenomenon we happen to be studying. Although, that's just my silly little interpretation. The equation can be written in a couple of different forms, but for the purposes of this video we'll be sticking with this form here, the integral form, because I think it's the most intuitive and easy to visualize way to understand this equation. Let's begin by first understanding what Q means in this equation. Q simply represents the amount of a particular quantity that we happen to be studying in a given region of space. For example, if we want to study the flow of particles through some region, then Q is simply the number of those particles in that region of space. If we're trying to understand the flow of energy, then Q is the amount of energy in that region of space. And there are lots of other quantities that Q could represent, which we will see later. But the point is that Q represents the amount of stuff that we happen to be studying in a given region. For those of you familiar with calculus, you may have spotted that this term, dq by dt, is simply measuring the rate of change of this amount of stuff. In other words, how much this stuff changes per unit time. If we stick with particle flow for now, then dq by dt simply represents how the number of particles in our region of space changes per unit time. If the number of particles in our region increases over time, then dq by dt is positive, and if it decreases, then dq by dt is negative. This term essentially measures how quickly the number of particles in our region changes with time. Let's move on to the second term then. It looks a little bit more intense, but let's work through it bit by bit. Let's start by looking at j. j is known as the flux of the quantity that we're studying. In the previous example, we were studying the number of particles, so j is the flux of particles. What does that mean? The flux of these particles basically measures how many particles are crossing a particular surface per unit time. And with the general definition of flux, we could be looking at any surface that we choose. So how many particles are crossing this particular surface per unit time? And importantly, the flux also accounts for the direction in which these particles are traveling. Now, the rest of this term basically deals with the total flux of these particles over a very specific surface. In particular, we're looking at a closed surface. Let's say that we choose this cube to be our closed surface, or at least the six faces of our cube form the closed surface. It's worth noting, by the way, that this cube is just an imaginary surface that we've decided to study. There's nothing physical about it. We've just chosen that this is going to be the closed surface that we want to look at. We can call this cube S, and we can look at the flux of particles across each one of this cube's faces. In our equation, dS basically represents a very small chunk of one of these faces. So what we're doing with this term is we're looking at the flux across lots of these little ds area elements, as they're known, and we're adding up all of the fluxes across all of these little area elements to find the total flux across the entire surface s. For those of you familiar with integration, this is not a new idea. Adding up lots of little bits to find the total whatever it is you're trying to find. But if this idea is new to you, then check out this video that I made a little while ago. It should hopefully clear things up. A couple of other things to note about this term. Firstly, the double squiggly lines tell us that we're integrating over a two-dimensional surface, two-dimensional area. And this makes sense because all of our little area elements are indeed areas, they're two-dimensional. Secondly, this loop here, this closed loop, tells us that we're integrating over a closed surface. This is why we had to choose something like S, which is indeed a closed surface. We could have chosen, for example, a sphere or, I don't know, something that looks like this, but it has to be closed. There can't be any openings to it. And of course, the s near the integral sign specifically tells us that in this case, we are integrating over the surface we have called s. Now, in reality, s doesn't have to be a cube. It can be any closed surface. But the important thing is that when we choose s for this particular term, we apply this same surface to the rest of the equation also. Lastly, it's worth noting that we could use a couple of different conventions for this term here, but the way that it's written, it's actually measuring the number of particles leaving our closed surface s. Basically, if this term ends up being positive, then we know that particles are leaving our volume through the surface S. And if it's negative, then we know that particles are entering our volume through the surface S. 
Now let's quickly go back to the first term in our equation. Remember that Q is representing, in this case, the number of particles in a particular region of space. I was very pedantic about saying region of space over and over again. Well, the important thing here is that the region of space we're considering is the region of space enclosed by the surface S. In other words, the first term is measuring the rate of change of the number of particles in our volume, which we can call V, and this volume is enclosed by the surface S. And the second term is simply measuring how many particles are entering or leaving that volume through the closed surface S. It therefore makes sense for the final term of this equation to simply be equal to the number of particles either created or destroyed in this volume. Let's just assume that for now this is possible. We can somehow create or destroy particles. We're not going to worry too much about the physics of that just yet. But basically, the intuitive understanding of what this equation is trying to tell us is most easily found, in my opinion, if we move this second term to the other side of the equation. Then this equation simply reads, number of particles created in our volume per unit time minus the number of particles leaving our volume through the surface S per unit time is equal to the net change in the number of particles per unit time. It's actually a fairly common sense based equation, this one. It essentially measures the creation or destruction of some particular quantity, as well as the flow of that quantity either in or out of the volume that we're considering. Now, what we've seen so far is a generic continuity equation that can be applied to lots of different scenarios. And the scenario we saw it applied to was when we were studying the number of particles in our volume V. But it can also be applied to other quantities such as energy, mass, fluids that can flow, and so many more. Interestingly, when we apply the continuity equation to conserved quantities, such as energy and momentum, you'll remember conservation of energy and conservation of momentum maybe as laws that you learned at high school. Well, in that case, this term here in the continuity equation becomes zero. Let's recall that very famous saying, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Well, if we're assuming that that's true, if energy is conserved, then the creation or destruction term must be equal to zero. Since energy is not somehow magically being created in our volume, neither is it being magically destroyed in our volume. The only thing that's happening is that there is a net change in the amount of energy in that volume, and the only way that that can happen is if it moves either in through the surface S or out through it. Now, the description I've used just then is kind of problematic because it seems to suggest that energy is stuff, it's a physical thing, when in reality it's just a mathematical concept. But the idea still holds, we can treat energy as something that flows, and in this case, because energy is conserved, it must flow in or out of any volume that we're studying, but it cannot be created or destroyed there. Or we could choose to apply this continuity equation to much more physically intuitive concepts. For example, the number of particles in a given volume, which we looked at already, or the flow of some viscous fluid. This continuity equation really is used everywhere. It's important to note though that we might use some different assumptions depending on the exact scenario that we're studying, but it's the logic that's important. This idea that stuff that flows must either be created or destroyed in the volume that we happen to be studying, or it must move across the surface of that volume. It can't just magically teleport itself from one place to another, basically. And that is a very simplistic view of the continuity equation. It really is a very important bit of mathematics. And with all of that being said, if you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Do hit the bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload. And please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for all your support as always. I'm going to be taking a short break over the next few weeks, so I will see you in 2021.